Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters and key figures from the publishing industry. Plus loads of hints, tips and inspiration for all creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review or just tell a friend. Right, cue that new theme tune. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 124 with comedy writer, actor and impressionist Julian Dutton. Julian's written for TV, radio and the stage, as well as penning a few non-fiction books as well. So he's got a wealth of experience and it was a really fun interview. Before we get to that, just a very quick update from me. I've been redrafting the opening of my novel. Nothing too major, but just uh, trying to sharpen things up and get straight into the action and refining a specific character interaction that's been dividing some of my early readers. Uh, After reading some more feedback of the revised chapter today uh, for some of my old Phoenix Writers friends on our Zoom critique session, the technology is there folks, use it. Uh, I've got a much clearer idea of the final little tweaks I need to make and then I've got to move to the other end of the novel and make some changes to the final scenes as well. When it comes to working on specific scenes and story beats, I've found putting pen to paper, I know that sounds obvious, but that's the best way for me to really bash things out. Actual pen and paper, not typing. I'm asking myself a series of questions, even if I already know the answer, almost like a stream of consciousness, but all the time drilling down to the purpose of the scene or the motivation of the character. Because when we get stuck on something, I think it's really tempting to just snatch at the first solution that presents itself. And sometimes, don't get me wrong, that solution is brilliant. But more often than not, the first idea is the most obvious, cliched way to do it. But by writing it down and pushing yourself to come up with two, three or even more possibilities, I think you're much more likely to come up with something original and surprising for your readers. Uh, And even if the idea, the first idea that you come up with is the best, you've already written it down and you've saved it. So what have you got to lose by coming up with other stuff? So that's the system that's been working for me lately. But what about you? How do you get past bumps in the road or what methods do you use to work out the beats of your story or script? Get in touch by tweeting me at JU Podcast or emailing Wayne at WayneKellyWrites.com as I'd love to hear from you. Also, don't forget to join the email mailing list at joinedupwriting.co.uk to get free stuff and be the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. Right, let's crack on with today's interview with Julian Dutton. So Julian's an English comedy writer and performer working for television, radio and stage who whose work has won a British Comedy Award, a BAFTA and a Radio Academy Gold Award for Best Comedy. He's written loads of TV shows, hundreds of hours of radio, including creating and co-creating many projects, and touring several one-man shows, including his latest, based on classic British sitcom Last of the Summer Wine. And as if that wasn't enough, he's also written a number of non-fiction books, including Keeping Quiet, Visual Comedy in the Age of Sound, which is out right now. So here's our chat, recorded just a couple of weeks ago, just after Julian had recovered from that dreaded virus. First of all, thanks for coming on, Julian. Really appreciate it. So just uh, explain for people listening whereabouts you're speaking from and and how things are going. I think you're just recovering, aren't you, from the, the dreaded C word? Ah, yes, absolutely. Well, I'm um, sitting in my uh, office stroke study in uh, Wales. I live in South Wales, beautiful part of the country. And uh, yes, thankfully, I have recovered. Um, I've still got a residual cough um, from the uh, the dreaded virus, as you say. Um, I had it uh, sort of early on in the in the uh, pandemic, really. So I, I I was going to say I was lucky to get I don't know if I'm lucky or not. I, I think I got it on the 12th. I, we sort of uh, pinpointed the 12th of March. I got the virus on the 12th of March. Right. And so I had the symptoms for about 19 days. So I'm out of I'm out of the woods. Very lucky. Had to go into hospital. Oh, really? But they were really oh, great. God, and right. so anybody out there listening, you know, who gets the virus and is fundamentally fit, then uh, all my good wishes to you and my good luck to you. 
I managed to be, uh, you know, my lung, they tested my heart and lungs, basically. So uh, the ECG and the SATs and everything, the oxygen levels. So I didn't have to go on, on, on to a ventilator. So thank heavens. Well, that's good. Yes, yeah, that, good to uh, hear. So you're yeah. on the mend. Well, that's good to hear. I am indeed. I am indeed. Well, obviously, the other side of it is it's affecting uh, lots and lots of careers. And I'm sure it's affecting you with your live stuff that you're doing. But aside from the fact you're obviously not being able to tour it at the moment, why don't you tell us a little bit about your most recent project, the adapting three episodes of um, classic British sitcom Last of the Summer Wine as a a one man show? (laughs) Absolutely. Well, um, one sort of hat that I wear is as an impressionist. I've been doing impressions for many years uh, on the stand-up circuit and in TV shows like The Big Impression with Alistair McGowan. Um, I wrote, I co-created that with him and we wrote four series, I think. And so we did lots of, uh, you know, impression sketches, etc. And I did an impression series on Radio 4 called The Secret World which ran for about five years, I think, with Bill Dare, Mm -hmm. the uh, creator of Dead Ringers. So that's sort of one of my major hats as as an impressionist. But after I did those impression shows and stand-up, I I wanted to do a long-form impressionist show, really. So uh, a couple of years ago, I created a a, a one-man show about John Mm -hmm. Lemaitre, which it was a a challenge for me because I, I wanted to do an impression show that was more than just kind of gags and quickies and sketches. So I devoted a whole show to his life. Uh, and this time around, my following show was um, Last of the Summer Wine, which was a recreation of, uh, as you know, the famous sitcom. And I, um, I adapted three episodes and it was basically a one man impression show with me playing all the characters really it was it sounds a bit <laughs> crazy but I, but I was uh, I was sort of um, a month into the tour I was meant to be touring that from January all the way through to August mm-hmm. but uh, as with every every performer it's just been uh, yeah. frozen in time yeah. Exactly, hiatus, and my last show was on the March the 13th, actually, uh, down in Devon, so it was going very well, but I've had to kind of, like everybody, I've had to reconfigure, realign, and uh, just put my writer's hat on. Yeah, um, yeah. Instead, take off my performer's hat and uh, put my writer's hat on. Back on. I suppose writing, writing is the sort of ideal professional for a lockdown so i'm getting i'm cracking on with that really well that's good so so when you're approaching something like that so the one-man show so obviously it's one thing adapting any kind of tv show for stage but to do it as a one-man show that must be really challenging so how do you approach something like that well what i did i was very careful to choose i mean there's such many there's so many episodes of last of someone it's the longest running uh, sitcom in in the world mm-hmm. so there were so many episodes to choose from so what i had to do was um select very carefully um, the impressions I did were were, were from the classic uh, Last of the Summer Wine, the early series, with Foggy, mm-hmm. um, uh, Bill Owen, and Peter Salas, uh, Clegg, and Compo. Mm-hmm. So I chose three episodes that were very focused on them. So I, uh, you know, I, I, I the later series, as if any fans are listening. They had a cast of about twenty-five, so yeah, big ensemble. That would have been a little bit busy. <laughs> <laughs> so I basically um, exactly. Yeah. So I took. Um, I did do other characters in the, in, the, in my uh, adaptation, but um, mainly Foggy, Clegg, and Compo. Absolutely. So you know, I was I was Foggy for um, you know a month, which was a, you know it was a great challenge. But uh, I like to think I rose to it, and um, it was a tribute to the. The wonderful comedy, really. <laughs> yes, indeed. I will. I will concur with that. <laughs> yes. Um. So yes, I did. Um, Brilliant. Uh, about ten, uh, about six or seven shows, I think. And uh, I was just getting stuck into the tour. But, uh, but writing wise, as you say, I mean, you're many a sort of writing. Mm. Um, your your focus is writing. Uh, I adapted the TV scripts, Roy Clark's TV scripts, as a sort of radio broadcast, in. There's a genre of touring show that's going around at the moment, which is um, sort of uh, recreations of classic radio shows. Like there's a Dad's Army tour yeah, going on yeah. with Jack Lane and um, and David Benson and James Hearn's One Man Hancock's Half Hour and also Round the Horn, and yeah. the Navy Lark. They've all toured around as stage shows. So I, I, I essentially um, sort of aspired to be that genre which is uh, recreating the show as if it's a radio recording. So it would be the format would be almost like stand up where I have a, I'd have a central stage mic and I would just present the entire episode as a as a one man impression show. So uh, it's a very I think people are very keen 
um, to there, there's a big taste uh, currently for nostalgic comedy. I think. Yeah. I um I don't know whether that's a sort of litmus test of the of the national mood, but um, I think it's probably think... The, the live experience as well, isn't it? It's the fact that that you can obviously a lot of these people are dead or they're not performing anymore or whatever the reasons yes. are. But I think it's being able to get that, that live experience now is that's, that's something different, isn't that experiential thing? Absolutely. And I think there's something in the sort of magician uh, about impressions. I've always uh, been interested in why people actually like impressions. And I think there's something of the, of the, uh, of the sort of magician in bringing someone to life, especially as if, if the person you're impersonating is, is no longer with us mm. to see them on stage, even if it's just the voice is kind of, it gives them a frisson of, uh, of pleasure. Um, it's always fascinating to me why people like impressions. I, you know, it's a mysterious thing. Somebody pretending to be somebody else and they, they laugh or they're happy. You know, it's, it's very strange, but yes, uh, I think it's the recreation aspect of it that they love. So the writing aspect of it was quite a challenge because Roy Clark's scripts were so very uh, richly written. They ha he has um, a, a distinct style of uh, of writing, comedy writing, which he was one of those class of comedy writers, I think, who y you could recognize if a line was lifted out of their script and you heard it, you could you could say, oh, yes, that's Roy Clark. Mm -hmm. Um it, 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 same with Eric Chappell, who wrote Rising Damp, mm -hmm. Golden and Simpson, Johnny Spate. They had very specific styles. And so it was a challenge. I, what I did was I wrote the narrative links between the um, scenes. So I told each episode as if it was a, a story. They were looking back on on their uh, their adventures. And uh, I did, you know, Peter Salas as the and narrative link yeah. so my challenge as a writer was um capturing roy clark's making style making sure it sort of writing. fitted into the same the same sort of well of course yes yeah. absolutely yeah so let's go back to the beginning then so, so tell us how you first got into all this acting and writing malarkey which came first was it the writing or the performing bug well it was the acting it was um performing i began as an actor in my sort of early 20s did all the usual things as a young actor i did rep and touring a couple of stints in the west end and then, like many actors, I think I started to um, f realize that instead of waiting for the phone to ring, it was far more fruitful to sit down and write your own mm -hmm. material. So I started writing little plays and I toured them and, uh, you know, did them in London, that kind of thing. And I started writing comedy, radio comedy, in the early 90s. Uh, I, I really uh, sort of discovered that I, I i enjoyed writing comedy more than anything else i'd written serious stuff i'd written a couple of uh, of novels a few short stories that got published but then i um i really kind of kind of caught fire with the comedy writing and i became a contract writer for the bbc in the early 90s um they engaged me on a contract to write for all sorts of comedy shows i mean it started off really in those days, you could just walk into the BBC, <laughs> yeah. show them a script. I mean, it's it's yeah, it's I mean, it was crazily easy. There was, a, there was a show called Week Ending, which had an open door policy where there'd be a writers' meeting every week, and I just took a bundle of sketches in, and I showed them to a producer, Bill Dare, actually, and they were broadcast two days later. The show was recorded, I believe, on a when. Oh no, no, the writers' meeting was on a Wednesday. The show was recorded on a Thursday, and it was brought. It went out on a Friday, so it was that quick turnaround. And suddenly, I realised, oh, hang on, yes, comedy sketches, okay, broadcast comedy, I can work with this. And um, I just, you know, then you, I showed a couple of scripts to the script editor Harry Thompson, and he commissioned my own um, comedy series called The Harpoon, which was a um, a sketch series, really. It was based on, uh, it was a kind of send-up of old magazines, boys' magazines of the 1930s, mm -hmm. like um, Chums and uh, yeah. The Eagle and that kind of thing. Um, I wrote that with Peter Bainham. And then I got my own audience sketch show, which is called Truly Madly Bletchley, which is a fantastically fun sketch show, um, which I performed with um, David Batley, who is a great actor who 
people will know the name and they will know his face. He, he was in tons of comedies. Uh, uh, Ratner Weekend Television he was in and um, That's Your Funeral with uh, Bill Fraser and all sorts of things. Liz Fraser was in the show as well. So, so that was a great series. And so the comedy writing just took off from there, really. And I, basically I performed everything I wrote. So it was a kind of a write my own ticket kind of thing. And then I moved on to TV comedy. So, so when you in those early days, obviously you, you walk in kind of as you say, very uh, well, not ignorant, but you were naive. Let's use that word. Yeah, so you, you just you just naive, walk yeah. in um, and you and you just try it. So, what did you kind of learn from that from those early days? Did, did, what you know? Did you? How did you? Because presumably you went in and this you mentioned working with a script editor mm. and obviously some yes. more seasoned performers and writers and things. So, what would you say you learned in those early days? Well, what you learn is, I mean, I of course wrote. When people start writing comedy, they they're they're instinctive and they just write it all down and uh, they. Uh, but I mean, I had a sort of fair idea of of how to write a comedy sketch um, and a and a sitcom script. To be honest, I kind of um, I am one of those people who believes that anybody can do anything really. I if you put your mind to it. I know that sounds quite Pollyanna, but I definitely believe that. So what I did was, before I submitted any scripts to the BBC, I sat down and I read all the available published scripts. There was a, there were some editions of, um, I think the the scripts for Porridge had been published. So I read all those, Rising Damp, and of course all all the sort of comedy books containing sketches, like the Monty Python books and uh, and uh, things like that. So I read all those. It, as a kind of self tutorial, but I think when you sit down to write your own, write your own stuff, you're still very you're still treading water a bit. So mm-hmm. what you do learn by sit by working with professionals and writing for a radio show is really the structure, the correct grammar of a comedy of comedy, the structure of a comedic sentence, the structure of a sketch, structure of a sitcom, because it does take a while to really learn and sandpaper off your weaknesses i mean for example i mean the technique i learned there's so much technique in comedy Mm -hmm. uh that you have to learn you can't just instinctively know it you can be instinctively funny and know what is funny but there's a difference between that and sitting down and writing a properly structured sketch or a script um you have to learn that and the only way how do you i mean how do you learn it well you just learn it by doing it. By, <laughs> by doing it, exactly, by doing it, by, by realising that this, a sketch, for example, has one focus and one target. Mm-hmm. The, the big mistake a lot of comedy writers beginning um, commit is thinking you can just bung lots of funny things into a sketch. Mm-hmm. You can't. It's, it's, it's got to have a distinct through line. I mean, you know, let's, let's take the most famous sketch, Dead Parrot Sketch by yeah. Monty Python. yeah. That's that's so. That's got a a distinct line. I mean, if they started talking about something else in that sketch, it would just destroy it. So I think that's a mistake I, I got over very quickly, realizing that it's it's like a you know it's, it's every single genre of every single piece of writing is the same. Really, it has a story structure. Yeah. And so you've got to stick to that story structure, whether it's a film, whether it's a poem, even, or whether it's a um, even a, you know a limerick, it's or a comedy sketch or yeah. a sitcom. That you can't just child's yeah, fairest, you, you yeah. can't just sort of crowbar in loads and loads of jokes. No. No, 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 no. It's got. It's got. The main thing is, it's got to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you head in somewhere basically. And both the characters exactly. in it are. They've got something they want to achieve, or some. I mean, the dead parrot sketch is a great example, isn't it? Very much. You've got. You know, he's coming in to do a very specific thing. Talk. You know, to complain yeah. about this thing, and he wants to get his point across. And the other guy is obviously doing anything he can to resist that idea. Absolutely. Yeah. Conflict. Um, all the elements of story, which we learn when we start to write film scripts, can just can be applied to comedy sketches. Conf- conflicts, especially, it's uh, that's a key component of it. Conflict, surprise, twists. I mean, a joke in itself is a twist, just like yeah. a thriller. Yeah, exactly. The same. Subversion. Yeah, unexpected, taking you suddenly off into the unexpected. There's lots. So there's lots of techniques. There's the reversal. Uh, you know, boom, 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 and then complete subversion at the end yeah. which is the uh, which is the joke 
And so when you when you first started out, so just just before you got into uh, radio comedy, so you obviously you were doing mm. sort of serious plays, um, a bit more dramatic yes. stuff, and all that kind of thing. And then presumably you started. You, you mentioned you did stand up. So was that one again? Was that one man stuff? Were you getting up and writing your own material and doing things there? Oh yes, yes. I was to, I was doing the uh, stand up circuit because in the early nineties, uh, the circuit had kind of really grown. Um, I was going to say it's the alternative comedy. So it was a little bit after the alternative comedy yeah. boom in a way, because that was really sort of early 80s. to mid eighties. Yeah. Yes, that was eighties. Really. Uh, but it was taking off, I think, in a big way um, in the nineties. So I was doing a stand up. Imp- I was doing an impressionist act, basically. Um, I made friends with Alistair McGowan, and lots of people on the circuit: Stuart Lee, Richard Herring, Harry Hill and peter bainham and we, we were all touring around we were also we were writing shows for radio and then tv but we were also um you know performing in the clubs and everything so i i toured around i did all those you know the university clubs all the comedy clubs in london and uh, so i'd shifted away from kind of straight acting and, and drama by then i was focusing on stand-up and what stand-up teaches you of course is um sharpness of material mm-hmm. to uh you have to pare it down really when you you could if you sit down and write a stand-up act you can be guaranteed to written way too much yeah uh because when you it's only when you perform it that's when you start to shed things it's like sandpapering again and you you could write half an hour of material and you could start performing it in the clubs and after every performance you trim it away trim it away and you'd end up with probably about five minutes. I mean, it takes ages to get a st- get twenty minutes of stand up. Mm-hmm. Uh, ages, a year, you know, a year probably. Yeah. Of of nonstop performing. I mean, it's people don't realise it's it is that hard. So that was good. I, mean, I really enjoyed it. It was great, great fun. I did Edinburgh and everything and all that stuff. So it comes, and, so um, it comes back to the writing is rewriting thing again, doesn't it? Because you're doing that. I mean, there's no more of. Uh, physical uh, description of that with with stand up because you're literally doing that every time you go out on stage as you say you're writing you're yeah. rewriting it you think okay that line needs to be shorter or i can drop that idea yes. or i can go from straight from that line to that line now and now i don't need that bit in the middle and you're sort of doing that on the fly aren't you absolutely i mean one of the big uh, techniques of stand up of course when you're creating an act is the order of things and i remember doing my first i was doing my first few shows and I was very lucky to have Harry Hill who saw me and um, I'd known him before because we were working together on radio, but uh, Harry gave me some great advice. Uh, he, he saw he saw my act and he just came, he just came up to me afterwards and said, right, okay, Julie, uh, put that line at the top, put that line there, <laughs> do this, do that. And it was like, a, it was like Jenga, you know, or, or a yeah. jigsaw puzzle. He knew that instinctively. And uh, so that's what I learned, that shifting stuff around, stuff that didn't get a big laugh um, in the first, you know, 30 seconds yeah. would get a big laugh further down the act. It's, it's very, very strange. Build up to Mysterious. it. Mysterious. Welcome me, yes. What, 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 what do you remember? I mean, do you remember the very first time that you did stand up? Do you, do you remember how that yes. came about and, and how it went? And how I was think it? everybody does. Yeah, I think everybody <laughs> does, really. It was in the, uh, a venue called the Comedy Cafe in um, uh, Islington. Just It was near Old Street, I think. It's a great venue, really good venue. And like many clubs, they had open nights, so I started off doing open spots. And, of course, I, 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 I was – I'm not going to say I, I died or went brilliantly. It was a mixture. And – I sort of knew I could do it, really. So then I pursued that for a few years. and uh, But the writing was always concomitant with it. And I, uh, the writing, script writing took over, actually. I was doing, after about a few years, I was doing more script writing. I was doing about 70% script writing because of the, uh, because I had, basically, I had children. I had uh, yeah. two children. So it was much more logistically um, amenable to uh, work as a script writer at home and then perform in the TV stuff, which didn't. But I, so I kind of put stand up on the back burner. It, it's not a great life being a stand up if you have children. I've got to be honest. No, you're um, on the road all the time. <laughs> juggling stuff. Oh, gosh, yes. So I kind of focused on the script writing. Um, but I was still performing in the shows I did. And do you think that the writing, sorry, the acting and the performing, do you think? 
that helps you with the writing from the point of view because often even people that haven't performed before when you're writing a book or whatever it is it's often said that you you're kind of acting out the roles or you're thinking and you're putting yourself in the heads of the characters and things do you think that sort of feeds into your writing quite a lot I mean obviously if you're you know you're going to perform it it's slightly different anyway but if you're writing stuff for yes. other people uh, and, or I know you've done like writing for channels, TV and all sorts of different things so you've got to kind of you've got to mm. perform it in some way presumably when you're writing it Yes, I think um, definitely. I mean, because when you perform it, you you could hear what's funny. So, yeah, I wrote for children's TV for seven years. That was great fun. I loved doing that. Um, and, of course, children's TV comedy is quite is quite broad. It's, uh, you know, very um, – it, it's the sort of home of um, – the last home of visual comedy, really, which is, which is what I love. Mm-hmm. I just love all the old slapstick um, comedians, Lauren Hardy and Chaplin and Keaton and so on. And uh, so I loved writing for uh, children's TV. I did Chuckle Vision for four years. And uh, then I wrote a series called, created a series called Scoop, which was a comedy sitcom. Sorry, that's what you invented a genre, comedy sitcom. <laughs> comedy sitcom. It was a sitcom. <laughs> yes, it was a sitcom. Um, with Hacker the Dog, I created Hacker the Dog, which is uh, he's still going. You're brilliant. He's he's um, he'll outlive us all. <laughs> um, yes, that was with Sean Williamson, and it was it was basically a a sort of I subverted the Tintin idea. I was a huge Tintin fan, Hergé's Tintin, and yeah. my idea was just to make so he was a reporter with a dog. But the reporter was a bumbling, incompetent fool. <laughs> the dog the was dog's, the, yeah. the dog was clever than yeah. him. I mean, that was the comic concept. Yeah. So that ran for about four series. That was great. And so yes, I, I mean, I was in that as well. So which was good. And um, it does help you. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say you have to perform in order to write comedy. I mean, many of the great comedy writers haven't performed. Mm-hmm. But it does. Yes, I suppose it does help. But it's not essential to perform. But I think most, I mean, it's an interesting point you make, actually, because what's happened with comedy writing in general is that there used to be a comedy writer Mm. and a performer. Mm. Now, more often than not, 90% of the time, they're the same person. Mm. If somebody gets a sitcom on on TV, they will write it as well. Lee Mack. I know he uses other writers, but he is a writer as well. Um, Most comedies, most sitcoms now, the, the 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 division of labor between you know the co- comedy writers who used to be called comedians laborers um has gone that's completely gone it's it's quite difficult now to get a sitcom on if you're not in it yeah do you think i was going to say do you change. think yeah do you think that a lot of that is coming from where they're kind of sourcing sitcoms from which tends to be like edinburgh and from you know performers that yes. they've seen and saying oh this comedian's doing really well he's on the open she's, she's on the open let's give them a absolutely you know, have you got there's ideas? been a whole yeah there's been a whole sorry to interrupt yeah but there's been you're absolutely right there's been a whole shift between uh, fr- there's been a shift essentially from sitcoms starring actors to sitcoms uh, sitcom starring actors written by comedy writers yeah to sitcoms starring comedians who write it mostly themselves, but just hiring a few writers maybe to gag it up. And I think you're right, Edinburgh has probably pushed that. Uh, to me, I don't, I mean, of course it's created some successes, but I think it's probably killed off the sitcom, to be honest. Yeah, I, I, it's killed off. It's killed, sitcom, well, for, yeah. well, precisely, I mean, I think, some, take something like a great sitcom, like One Foot in the Grave, starring Richard Wilson. Yeah. I cannot see that being made today. I cannot see a comedy writer pitching that to a broadcaster and then saying, oh, I'd like uh, Richard Wilson to star in it. Mm. I can't see them saying yes. I think they'd probably say, let's rewrite, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. cast a comedian. Which is sad, isn't it, really? Big comedian. And it's because not every comedian can do sitcom. It's, it's not the same genre. No. It's not the same genre at all. A, the great sitcoms have been actors, uh, yeah. especially fed Step, by the yeah. rep. Steptoe and some stuff like that. Yeah. So you've got two great actors there. It's Adley, Dad's Army. All the big sitcoms yeah. we can think of, you know, from Only Fools and Horses onwards, yeah. and yeah. Dad's Army, well, from Hancock's up. Well, now Hancock was a comedian, but he was the last, I think he was one of the last kind of, in those days, you see, the very early days of sitcom, they were feeding off variety. Yeah. So you, 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 but but 
really, I think you're right, stepped on some as the first kind of actor's sitcom. Um, oh, no, well, the army game had Bill Fraser, so that's... Uh, anyway, we're going back, we're going back a bit. <laughs> but yeah, to, uh, back, back to today, Julian. Back to today, um, it's, I think, a sitcom's in a bit of a problem. I don't know, though, you see, I don't want to be one of these people who says, oh, you know, the, the old days are the best. Certainly not. I love new comedy, and I especially think this country it's a fantastic sitcom. Uh, the recent uh, sort of mockumentary on BBC Three, set in the West Country, fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're actors, and they're actors, but yeah. they write it themselves, of course. Yeah. So, so that coming back to that again, with that the idea, I mean, that that's mm. a good example. That kind of links us back to the idea, the fact that they've got two writers there that have kind of written something for themselves, and that's kind of how you started yeah. out, and you kind of yeah. seem to cotton on to that pretty pretty early was that kind of a product of the usual thing because I, I had another actor on here only a few weeks ago and he was saying sort of saying similar sort of things you know you get tired going for audition after audition after audition or whatever and just constantly just being waiting for the next call or the next uh you know the next yes. audition so you think well let me just mm. go and do something mm. myself was that kind of the same for you absolutely i think i'm a firm believer in writing your own tickets just to create your own thing i mean i uh, that's why I created my own shows. And uh, it, it, I, I mean, when people used to ask me, aspiring writers or whatever, how do you get into comedy? I would, I used to say, well, send that, send your script into so and so at the BBC or whatever. Now, of course, the internet's changed everything, and I say to them, put it out yourself, make, make it yourself, it, put yeah. it on, put it on the internet. We are, we are our own broadcasters now. The old gatekeepers are dissolving. Mm -hmm. I mean. The BBC is is uh, might become a subscription channel. The internet has taken over. There are no gatekeepers. There's no excuses anymore for not actually creating something and broadcasting it. Because you can you can brought, you can make something for nothing now. You can make a sketch show for fifty quid and put it out on the internet. And if it's funny, people will watch it. Exactly. It, it, there's no excuses now for anyone not to succeed. <laughs> so this is the thing. This is the big wake-up call, I think, to people or to writers. In the old days, you had to persuade so many gatekeepers that your stuff was worth making. Now you can just make it yourself. So there's no excuse. And um, and I think it's been a wake-up call in the sense that the internet hasn't actually suddenly created this deluge of brilliant stuff. It, there's still the same amount of good stuff and, and and the same amount of bad stuff. I in fact think you know we're seeing more bad stuff than good stuff. Yeah. So the t the internet hasn't increased the amount of talent human beings have. Um, it, 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 what it's done is increased your opportunity for finding out if you're any good. So get out there and do it, basically. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to. The days of sending your stuff, you're sending your script to somebody sitting in an office, usually London, to find out whether it has their approval or not, are over. Those days are over. I caught the last sort of two decades of it. And, you know, I've been lucky. I've written, uh, I thought, around 50 episodes of TV and several hundred episodes of radio. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky. I kind of caught that, and I managed to persuade people that my stuff was worth making. But, but now I don't know. I mean, I'd have to make it all myself, I suppose. But <laughs> but, uh, but but that's what so that's what I would encourage any writer. If you want to be a comedy writer, forget the forget the gatekeepers, forget the old models. Do it yourself. Um, put it out. And if you can't perform, just get a friend who's an actor or whatever. Or, yeah. Somebody that's funny. Yes, absolutely. Somebody else to do it. So, so uh, obviously, a lot of the stuff that you've done, you you started off and you were writing all this stuff yourself, and you were you know putting it together, and you've done one man shows and everything else. But obviously, a big part of what you've done, especially with like the sketch show stuff, would be collaborating with other writers and performers. How, how do you find that? And have you got any kind of tips for for people that maybe are used to working on their own, and then they suddenly get thrown into this situation where they collaborating with sure lots of sure well most um, most comedy shows uh, sketch shows in particular the big impression and uh, most other tv shows i've written for um are the result of writers rooms where you go in at the beginning of a series you've had all your own idea you've had your ideas and you pitch your ideas to the table mm -hmm. and they get put through the mincing machine and um they get chosen or not i mean i i would 
in my life I've some sometimes written with a partner and sometimes not. I wrote a series, uh, uh, a lovely radio series called Inside Alan Francis, which was a radio comedy sketch show, which I wrote with Alan. Mm-hmm. And the big impression, though, there were about three or four main writers on the show and um, about four or five others who just contributed little bits and pieces. But we basically, we'd sit around a table, pitch ideas, and sometimes somebody would enhance your idea. But you'd always go off and write it on your own or very occasionally with somebody else. With the TV sitcoms, with Chuckle Vision, that was a great way. They had a great way of making the series. <laughs> Chuckle Brothers. Yeah. I, know, I know it's not sort of um, highfalutin, sophisticated comedy, but it's. I, I've got a real. I've got a real. Um, what's the word? Bone to pick? I think that's an expression. About people who kind of look down on light entertainment, like yeah. Chuckle Vision. I think just as much work and just as much intellect goes into the creation of light entertainment slapstick stuff as the sophisticated sitcoms. I really do. Mm -hmm. Because it's the same nuts and bolts. And what we do at the beginning of every series of Chuckle Vision, about five of us would sit down around a table and we would flesh out the entire series. What we'd, we'd do is create 13 episodes. Obviously we'd write them. But yeah. just the structure, the yeah. idea for the episodes. So then we would be given episodes to go off and write. I think that's how the soaps work. I've never written for a soap. I did write a spec script for EastEnders once, but uh, <laughs> they you? said it was too funny. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. So I wanted to write for EastEnders. I well, love Peter the show. Peter Kay and, got uh, away, for, well, away with it when he did uh, Coronation Street. I mean, they, they gave him an episode of Coronation oh, yes. Street, and it was it was like no it other did. episode of Coronation Street you've ever seen. It's <laughs> completely different. I didn't just actually see it, in. but I'd love to see it. But yeah. yeah, I'd love to see it. Well, Coronation Street has a kind of tradition of being comic, A bit I funny, guess. yeah, yeah, yeah. But EastEnders, you know, is quite gloomy, and of course yeah. I had... Um, it's full of funny scenes. Yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> I think I had Billy discovering buried treasure. At one point, <laughs> I, I liked it. I thought it was great. I think it's you really should put cute. it out. There's nothing to stop you <laughs> putting it out there. Yes. They are, mate. I'm, it could appear one day. Yeah. Uh, but whereas, yeah, so what we do is... Uh, um, yeah. You were saying about Chuckle Vision. Yeah. all the episodes, all the uh, Chuckle Brothers. But then we'd go off and write scripts and we'd stuff them full of our own gags and everything. So... But writing with other people, I, it's great. I love it. Um, I, I'm just going to correct myself there. I do actually prefer writing on my own because I go off into a kind of a dream world. Mm-hmm. Um, but writing with somebody else is quicker. It's uh, You can just um, spark off each other and, uh, and build ideas and stuff. I, I think, but, I mean, um, having, having done a little bit of it myself, I, I, the thing yeah. that I, and I sort of, uh, relate to what you're saying there because I think it's great for doing the big picture stuff. I think it's really good for bashing out a, a, a structure or the story and putting the bare bones yeah. of, of stuff down. Um, but what I'm not so keen on is having to come up with very specific things in the moment with one or more people. I'd like to, I'd sooner go away and just think about it and let my mind drift or whatever yes. i think it's kind of for me it works better like that where i know some people they can just come up with stuff you know wherever and very specific things like that but yes. i think it i do think it's great for for bashing out uh, the, the sort of arc or the big the big kind of structure of something um and then going off and doing your yes. own things i do empathize with that i mean i like both actually i like you know sitting on my own and just going yeah. off into a drift and dream and coming up with ideas but i also like the cut and thrust of a writer's room i think it's great i you know if you can if you can lose the inhibition to say something that's not funny but yeah, i think yeah. if you're in a room where people i got over that very early on really to, to sort of think oh if i say this will they find it funny or not and i think you know it just it doesn't matter because I think, you can just throw it away i mean you, of course you, yeah um, you've got to be willing to to say something. I mean, look, I mean, even the Beatles sat around playing their instruments and came out with a naff tune and said, yeah. no, let's move on. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't beat yourself up about that. So if you're in a room where you don't know anybody, um, just uh, just be relaxed. I, I think improvisation is great. If, you, if you've done improvisation, that's exactly what it is in a writer's room. Mm-hmm. You're sparking off other people and... Uh, some of my best ideas, I think, have come from 
the spark comes from between people. So if you, so, as we kind of uh, move to wrapping things up, so if you were um, starting out again tomorrow, what would yes. you what would you do differently, if anything, or would you just gosh, you know, gosh? A, well, I I, I don't. It's interesting because I mean, when I was starting out writing scripted stuff, um, my main ambition I thought I I wanted above all to get my own radio series. And I had no idea how to do it, really. It was just kind of an accident that I thought, oh, hang on, I'll just walk into the BBC and show them a script. <laughs> so that was how, it, uh, how I would do things differently. I think uh, having, <laughs> having given a big speech about uh, the Internet is the thing and how it's changed everything, um, yes, but I think there's so much landfill out there in the Internet that... It's, it would be very difficult to stand to out. get noticed. It basically is a paradox. Exactly, stand out. You, it, it, there's never been more opportunities to make your own stuff now and get it out there, but it's but it's it's the it's never been more difficult to actually get noticed. That's the big paradox of the internet. Mm. So I would probably put out a sitcom on the internet or a sketch show, and who knows. It might, it might might have got noticed, might not have done. I can't really say. I think I would probably um, try to get the big broadcasters. I, I know I've just contradicted myself. No, um, I know, what, but I do. I think but you know what I mean. I, yeah, yeah, I do. I think there's a bit of um, there's a bit of hybrid stuff going on at the minute, anyway, because there's lots of stuff. Again, mm. I mean, obviously Edinburgh is one way that, like, say for example, the BBC picks up a lot of stuff, but then uh, YouTube is a, is an, is another way that stuff gets picked up. There's people like um, yes, the guy that did um, Man Like Mabeen, uh whose name escapes me at, at this precise minute in time, but he he started yeah. off doing YouTube clips. Um, of course, and, of course, you know, yes. they, they got quite a lot gained a lot of popularity and then he got kind of picked yes. up. so there is another way of doing it and the, the other thing i guess yeah. the, the other thing that you get with today's uh being able to use the internet and everything is you can kind of make all your mistakes early on and it not be a big deal because i suppose if you do get picked up for tv or radio mm. or whatever i suppose you only get so many chances to mess it up uh, or to try things it's a very out. good point very good point and of course there's so much more so many more restrictions, uh, broadcasting regulations, etc., with the mainstream broadcasters. So yes, you know, I would probably do an internet show, uh, and then with the, in the hope of getting picked up. So yes, put it out there, make mistakes, have fun. Uh, I mean, my main focus now, for example, um, especially during this coronavirus times, the strange times we're living in, is writing books. I mean, I'm very lucky to have had some books published and. Um, so I've always got that, and I've just had another book commissioned, um, which is like a, a history book. I read a history of comedy. Yeah, uh, a I was few going years to talk to you about that. Yeah, yeah, and um, this history publisher got in touch with me and said, "Look, we loved your history of comedy. Uh, would you like to why, pitch us another book?" And um, so I did. So I'm working on that at the moment. It's a uh, it's a history book. Um, I'm delivering it to the publishers in um, August. But the thing is, because of this lockdown, I'm actually writing it much faster than I'm meant say. to do. You might might be able to I'm, I'm hand sort of, over two. <laughs> well, I might give it give it to them tomorrow. Um, and I'm, I'm having to slow down uh, because obviously I really enjoy writing, and I want to spin it out. I don't know how much how longer this lockdown is going for. So uh, that's that's a book about it's the history of life on rivers and canals in Britain. I know it sounds very curveball and left field. It for a comedy writer but um how did that come but about it's basically well as i say i wrote this history of comedy called keeping quiet which was a history of visual comedy and a publisher got in touch with me and said pictures a history book so um i grew up on a houseboat you see i grew up on the river thames ah. and they knew the publisher knew i was involved in this campaign to preserve and protect there's a, there's a there's some houseboats in chelsea where i grew up uh cheney walk and they're under threat by the landlord. It's all very kind of healing comedy. And um, mm -hmm. so I was involved in that. So they asked me to pitch a, a history of uh, living on the rivers and canals. It's fascinating. It's from 2000 BC to the present day. I'm aspiring for it to be a bit like one of those Bill Bryson's books, you know, a bit of an odyssey. where you can just pick a, pick a subject and just yeah. write about everything. You know. So that's what I'm focused on at the moment, delivering it in July. My UK tour... 
of Last of the Samoyans, sadly cancelled. Might come back, but I don't know because I had to buy the rights for a very specific time. So that's on the shelf now. Are you um, able to put that? Do you think you'd consider doing that as an online thing or anything? Because that's another option with it. And possibly, I, I, but because I'm using another writer's material, um, it has to be very specifically again, it's, used. It's well, it's rights issues. You see, yeah, I, yeah. I bought I bought the rights for a specific stage show, so I think, sadly. That month of touring I did is, is is the life of the show. What a shame! But you know, hey, we have to move on and do yeah. other stuff. Yeah. So hopefully, I'll be creating a new stage show for the autumn. Excellent. So that's me, and good luck to everybody else who's in the same boat and. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Or yeah, yeah. A houseboat uh, mm. in your case. Absolutely. So, <laughs> um, so where Very can good. people <laughs> where can people find you find out about oh, you? Oh well, gosh, you're on Twitter, well, aren't you? Things. I know you're on Twitter. Yes, I'm on Twitter, Julian Dutton. I basically just Google Julian Dutton. I've got a couple of websites. I've got a WordPress website, which details all my work. Um, my books can be found on Amazon. Sorry, this is sounding very much like a plug now. but uh, No, please plug um, away. That's the idea. Uh, my book, uh, yeah, my comedy book, Keeping Quiet, yeah. uh, a history of visual comedy, can be found on uh, published by Chaplin Books uh, on their website. And my... History book all about rivers and canals is <laughs> coming out on the from the the history press. That's it coming out from the history press, but that won't be coming out until next spring, I think. So uh, you can look out that's, for that. That's uh, a little bit of way. Thank you, thank you. That's yeah, all sure. right. Well, I'll put all that stuff in the show notes anyway. But for the time being, Julian, that's great. Thanks a million. Thank you very much, Wayne. Okay, thanks again to Julian Dutton, and you should definitely check out his website, blog, and Twitter, and I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. But that's it for this week, but don't forget you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. Make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or wherever else you get your podcast to have the podcast downloaded automatically every week you can also find it on youtube also remember to leave us a nice rating and review on apple Podcasts, as it really helps others to find the show or even you know just tell someone else about the show either with your voice box you know your actual voice you can speak to people you know on the phone or zoom i know you've got a socially distance and all that or just digitally on your social media platform of your choice next episode is a fascinating chat with novelist jessica anthony so look out for that next week until then thanks for listening i'm wayne kelly happy writing stay safe and i'll see you next time